To kick off our welcome community mixer, it's my pleasure to introduce Lisa J. Brownlick, uh, Dean of the University of Washington College of the Environment. As the inaugural Dean, she has led UW Environment since 2010. She's the Mary Laird Wood Professor of Environmental and Forestry Sciences at UW, with her primary research interests in paleoecology and the ways that ecosystems and human societies adapt to climate change. She pioneered the use of tree reading data to understand long-term climate trends and has had a career-long interdisciplinary interest in how to best manage natural and human resources in an uncertain future of global climate change. She is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the Ecological Society of America, and the Earth Leadership Program, and she is a member of the Board of Directors of the American Geophysical Union. Welcome, Lisa, and thank you for joining us. Well, Owen, thank you, and thank you to all of you for allowing me to be the UW, welcome. Um, as Dean, you know, you, you play these roles. And so one of the things that you do is you announce to people, you know, welcome to UW. And are you aware that we, you know, we just get these rankings, you know, so like we are now number 16 in the world and we're number three among public universities. And, you know, you say these things. And what I think is really interesting about those is the way UW got there is exactly the kind of work you are doing right now. We crawled up through the rankings. It's not like really likely like why a state university tucked in the Northwestern part of the United States would end up being number three. And it's because we emphasized interdisciplinary, deeply collaborative, boundary spanning work, and particularly work that try to create continuity between discovery-oriented work and applications and actually getting that work out into the community. And so, you know, when I read those, those numbers, it thrills me because we were not there a couple of decades ago and the way we got there is the kind of work you are doing. So thank you for what you do. Um, thank you to the organizers. So at UW, I know there's a cast of thousands, undoubtedly, that like helped make this, but I'm particularly aware that you've got some champions among the faculty, um, particularly in civil and environmental engineering. Thank you, Erkan Estenbuloglu and Bart Nielsen, who I'm sure are there someplace in a little box. Um, thank you to Quasi. Thank you to ESIP. Are these acronyms that need no introduction, I'm guessing? <laughs> Um, so we'll keep, thank you to NSF, um, thank you to the Sloan Foundation, thank you to the Moore Foundation, money always helps these kinds of things. But, you know, I really want to thank you as participants. Every single one of you could be doing something else on a beautiful August day. Moreover, with the kind of skills you have, I venture to say you could be making twice as much money as you're making in the private sector, in finance in engineering and you are here working on issues of water sustainability and I am very very grateful and what you're doing is you're in a hack a thon and I want to tell you a little story about what the a thon of your hack a thon means to me and so you know we know like when you stick a thon on something like mayor a thon or you know it means it's going to take a while and I think right now the organizers are thinking like this is an athon because we're going to keep you in these Zoom rooms for what, like five days? You know, it's like, it's a lot of Zooming. It's a thon. Um, but you know what? It's actually a bigger athon than that. Um, you're going to come up with ideas. You're going to come up with plans. You're going to come up with prototypes. You're going to come up with all sorts of stuff that help us understand these issues of water and resources and livelihoods, but <laughs> the work won't be done. That this is a long, long trek. And yeah, I'm in my last year of being Dean, so I'm kind of taking the liberty of telling stories a little bit more. So I've been on Athans. In 1977, I was a master's student at the University of Wisconsin. I was taking a climate class from a really famous guy. And there was a drought on the West Coast that spring. And it started at the US-Mexican border. It went all the way 
to the U.S. Canadian border. It was the whole West Coast was in drought in 1977. And people actually had to change their behavior. Like you couldn't water your lawn every day and wash your car and you had rules about flushing toilets. And we had not had a drought like that since the 1930s. So the professor calmly says in 1977, you know, we really don't know if this is natural variability or climate change. So I'm a 20 something year old sitting on one of those little wooden desks like in the olden days. I, I can tell you exactly where in that room I was because I internally freaked out. You're a famous climatologist and you can't tell me if this is natural variability or climate change. And don't we think that's probably an important thing to know, 1977. <laughs> so <laughs> I became a paleo climatologist, paleoecologist, because I wanted to use tree rings and other paleoecological data to extend climate records back in time, to be able to characterize natural variability, to be able to see, was this incremental warming that we were seeing within that envelope of natural variability, or was in fact it the smoking gun that indicated anthropogenic climate warming? 1977, this starts. So if you follow this kind of thing, you may be aware that somewhere right around the turn of the millennium, um, Michael Mann and others published a thousand year history of the Earth's climate. That was me and my colleagues working for two decades. We didn't call ourselves data scientists then, but creating the paleo climate robust estimate of the Earth's temperature. Thousands of collaborators around the world brought together that allowed the IPCC to stay in 2001 with great confidence that the warming of the last two decades exceeds the natural variability of the last thousand years. So that was my personal a-thon. And it's the kind of work that you're doing, which is half nerdy technical stuff, like, you know, can you get codes to work and data sets to, disparate data sets to sort of talk to each other. But a lot of it is human and it's finding people that have a similar vision and that are willing to roll up their sleeves and that will work with you to sort of bridge the communication divides that happen when we all get together from different sub-disciplines. So I feel um, real blessed that in 1977, I came up with a great question and it has driven me, believe me, for decades. And, um, and we came up with answers and we came up with then implications of those answers. Um, and we did it together. So I want you to all pause right now. I'm gonna make one of those uncomfortable silences where I'm not gonna talk for like 20 seconds. And I want you to think about why are you doing this? What is your purpose? What is your North Star? And I'm really not gonna talk. Okay, with that in mind, I'm going to quote Chadwick Boseman, his 2018 commencement address at Howard. If you haven't heard it, you should. This is, this, could, this is so perfect for you guys. Purpose crosses disciplines. Purpose is an essential element of you. It is the reason you are on the planet at this particular time in history. Your very existence is wrapped up in the things you are here to fulfill. Sorry, he passed, we're sad. Um, so not to put much pressure on you, but welcome to the hackathon. Welcome to sustainable water resources for our children and our children's life. You got some work to do, go do it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Lisa. Thank you very much for your remarks. Thank you so much. Yeah, that um, I think very motivational <laughs> leads leads excellently into um, next. We want to share some of the work being done by some of the participants that are here in the hopes of building those human connections um, while we're here at Water Hack Week. And yeah, this uh, I guess really is a marathon be beyond just the one week, but really for the, the careers we've chosen um, in water science. Uh, so we have six great uh, lightning talk videos I'll be playing. Um, those are about two minutes each and we'll open it up afterwards for about four minutes for questions. Um, please direct your questions to, there is a Slack channel called Lightning Talks. And if uh, Owen, would you be able to sort of moderate those and maybe feed the questions or, or read them out loud so that the, um, the different presenters could then um, answer those? Um, so that this was to hopefully try and um, prevent everyone from unmuting at once if everyone has questions at the same time to try to control that flow. Um, so I will go ahead and we'll get started with our first uh, presentation here. I'm a PhD student in civil engineering at UC State University. And my research focuses on testing water consumption changes using smart meter systems. Customer consumption patterns are thought to be quite confusing. We expect a peak in the morning as people wake up, a decrease during the day as they go to work and other activities, and another increase in the evening as people are going home. We're interested in how major events change people's water consumption habits. One case study is related to a major pipe break. Previous weekdays indicate a typical expected pattern, but on the day of the event, plotting all residential smart water meter nodes, we can see a flattening of the evening peak, indicating that people were confined to essential water sanitation orders. COVID-19 also posed a challenge and new patterns for water distribution. This is from a town in California. On the Friday prior to executive orders system in place, we can see a typical consumption pattern with a morning and evening peak. However, after stay-in-place order, we can see that water use rises when people wake up and has only small increases during the day, with no sharp decrease for people leaving the home. I'm interested in when these changes occur over time and who is changing their consumption and looking these slides in the graph. It helps help water companies understand where they see population trends. All right, um, thank you, Morgan, for your presentation on your work there. Um, I actually have a question. Um, when, you, when you talk about de demographics of water use, um, does that also include like commercial industrial water use versus domestic? Yes, definitely. Um, that's the probably the biggest focus when I said demographics is the, the different user types. Um, and I have two different data sets I'm working with, but they both break down who's commercial, who's residential, um, schools, and other breakdowns. Have any other questions? Stephen, I do think we were struggling with, so with the volume a little bit. Is there a way to bump that up and maybe yes. run through it again? Yes, that, thank you. That would be great. Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that. No worries. Adapting to new technology. Sorry, I did not really hear anything in the last slide. Um, the last, yeah. My name is Morgan DiCarlo. I'm a PhD student in civil engineering at NC State University. And my research- Is this volume le level better? Much better. Yeah, much better. I'm sorry about that, everyone. We will just redo this. 
My name is Morgan DiCarlo. I'm a PhD student in civil engineering at NC State University. And my research relates to detecting water consumption changes using smart meter data. Customer consumption patterns are thought to be quite consistent. We expect a peak in the mornings as people wake up, a decrease during the day as they go to work and other activities, and another increase in the evening as people are getting home. I'm interested in how major events change people's water consumption behavior. One case study is related to a major pipe break. Previous weekdays indicate the typical expected pattern, but on the day of the event, plotting all residential smart water meter nodes, we can see a flattening of the even peak, indicating that people were complying to essential water limitation orders. COVID-19 also creates a challenge and new patterns for water distribution systems. This is from a town in California. On the Friday prior to executive orders to stay in place, we can see a typical consumption pattern with a morning and evening peak. However, after stay in place orders, we can see that water use rises when people wake up and has only small increases during the day with no sharp decrease with people leaving the home. I'm interested in when these changes occur over time and who is changing their consumption and looking this by demographics. I hope to help water companies understand where they will see operational increases. Looks like Jill Fallman has a question for Morgan. Hi, thank you, Morgan. And sorry, I didn't know if that was the right Slack channel. I forgot which one. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. Lightning Talks is also good. Uh, help Desk sorry, is Sorry, I don't good. think that. Oh. No, no worries. Uh, help Desk is also. Uh, okay. It works fine. <laughs> um, my question for Morgan How do you think the pandemic has changed water consumption patterns? Is that something you've had a chance to look at yet? Or. Um, it's something that we're just starting to look at, and I'm really excited um, and hope that we can talk about that as a topic this week. Um, so far, something that I think we'd expect, um, higher use during the day at residential nodes, um, no decrease as people leave for work. Um, I think that we could expect that, but we really don't know how that affects distribution systems yet, and if there's this increased loading on the smaller pipes that go up to people's houses. So I don't think we know anything about the long-term um, repercussions of this pandemic yet, but it's very interesting and very important. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Morgan. We can move on to the next presentation now. Hello everyone, my name is Ning Ren. I'm a PhD student at Washington State University. My research is to study the wildfire and beetle outbreak under climate change. I'm mainly using computer simulations to understand how this uh, wildfire and bug beetle interact with each other under climate change. And um, the motivation is that as we see in recent years, there's an increase of wildfire in Pacific Northwest, especially in California, we can see uh, there are a lot of fire. And um, this affecting our daily life, such as uh, like air quality and the water quality. So it's starting to understand what's driving this fire and beat outbreak, and also how they change in the future. So we can get a better understanding of these uh, different drivers and give a better information to fire management uh, under climate change. So the main takeaway from policy part is that Smokey Bear is the mascot of fire suppression for uh, many years. And uh, it's mainly uh, trying to protect the uh, timber production industry as well as property uh, in the in during fire. However, 
with our recent funding, we can see that actually suppression uh, is not that efficient and we need more approach to mitigate fire risk, such as we need to prescribe fire to build barriers before the fire coming, or we need to do some biomass reduction treatment to reduce fire risk. Sometimes we even need to live with fire. So we propose this Dr. Fire Fox to replace a smoky bear, and um, which represents our diverse fire management strategies, and also we follow closely with the new scientific findings. Mm, that's all. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Uh, we can open it up to questions. I have a question. Um, what are the kind of data that you use to input in these models? Like, I, actually, I'm, do, do you use LIDAR data to describe like the forest structure or just uh, land use cover data? Sorry, I muted myself. Yeah, for this area, we're using uh, land cover data to describe the forest type and vegetation type. Uh, but for my, some other location we're using LiDAR data too. It depends on do we do have LiDAR data, but we can uh, use that for sure. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. You have any other questions that came up? Yeah, a question from Brent. Uh, what database did you use to locate vegeta uh, vegetation infested with beetles? And, and uh, love the Dr. Firefox. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, and so the, the beta outbreak is uh, published uh, like a professor from UI, which I also collaborate with from uh, called Jeff, Jeff Haig. He published a beta outbreak uh, like a map for, from um, 2000, uh, from 1998 until 2010. So I'm mainly using that map data to classify the bit outbreak area. And uh, yeah, that's the data I'm used. And then Elaine Krausman also has a question. Hello? Yeah, Elaine, go ahead. Go. Hello? Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah. oh, oh, okay, sorry. So uh, I have actually two questions. One, why did you use your fox? That's great. Um, we've been studying communication tools and risk for a long time and Smokey the Bear, you know, doesn't even have to give his message. Um, it, it's known from the icon. Did you do some testing with your population on the fox? And thank you so much for your presentation. Um, so the Firefox is, um, the idea is like, uh, I just figure out with my colleague, if we need to find a, like a more proper mascot to replace Smokey Bear. So, but we also need to include in fire because fire, we need to live with fire in the future. So uh, then Firefox seems like the character we fit this well. And this actually from the cartoon called Zootopia, and uh, can I, can we get inspiration from that? The other is uh, uh, we think for Firefox also uh, they are smart and clever, and uh, we gave them a title called Doctor and a female character, and uh, it's to make uh, some more. Uh, more, more um, compliant with our uh, new science funding and also uh, follow the science. That's our <laughs> idea. <laughs> Brilliant idea. <laughs> I think so, but you could test it some. I think it's great. I think the choice of character was wonderful. Also, in the future, we want to hear about your water connection on your framing slide. You showed water, so that would be good to hear more about at some point. Sure. Thank sure. you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, thanks, Ning. Um, yeah. We can move on to our next presentation. 
Hi, my name is Brent, a graduate student from San Diego State University. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about my research today on investigating prediction tools for flow rates for Southern California watersheds after fire. Shortly after fire, post-fire risk assessment teams worked swiftly to publish findings on risk to downstream assets, including communities, infrastructures, and ecosystems. A common method used by these teams to predict peak flooding in the row et al. 1949 methodology, otherwise known as RCS. RCS is a publication with lookup tables for 256 watersheds throughout Southern California that model 24-hour storms. Um, Cal Fire Management was concerned that these predictions were under-predicting the actual floods. So, we performed a validation study for the study area shown here on the left um, for 33 different watersheds. As you can see from the images down below on the left uh, from a 2018 fire, the sediment laden flows can wreak havoc for your local neighborhood concrete channel. Um, so to test RCS, we first tested the RCS pre-fire unburned predictions. The less frequent larger storm events generally had um, largely negative bias that used to believe the RCS could be under predicting watersheds before the fire. Um, to test the post-fire conditions, we compared the observed flow um, on average, the performance was much worse with a negative bias around 7 to 8 CMS per square kilometer. It was also noted that 13 storms recorded post-fire flows that were under-predicted by the 100-year post-fire prediction. After analyzing RCS, we decided to create our own mathematical model using a random forest machine learning algorithm. This method consisted of collecting 45 watershed predictors. Um, the motivation behind each predictor was from a comprehensive literature review and tested them against 74 storms across our study area to predict post-fire peak flow immediately after fire. We calibrated the model to achieve similar model accuracy with just the five predictors shown in black. This model was then run to achieve R squared of 0.46. Uh, currently, to finish my thesis, I'll be building a random forest model to predict runoff at an annual time scale for up to several years after the fire. My concept is this. I will use satellite-based vegetation indices to estimate annual vegetation recovery. Then I will input all watershed predictions from the previous experiment, now with the water year time scale, into the random forest algorithm, with the output of the function to be annual runoff in millimeters. I hypothesize this model will have higher accuracy than the previous one due to the larger time scale and uh, eliminating uncertainty coming from predicting peak flows with high degrees of sediment concentration. All right, really cool. I love that animation. California there. Um, I guess to start off, I, I have a question. Um, when you did your random forest model, um, were there any variables that you were surprised had, had were uh, strong at predicting um, or, or maybe surprised that they weren't strong um, predictors in your model? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I think the the biggest surprise to um, the res or the the machine learning algorithm was the soil burn severity, uh, which for a lot of models is very important. And our random forest model essentially predicted not very important. But um, something that we noted in our data is that we were doing a pretty large sample size of, of historic fires, and uh, soil burn severity actually wasn't collected prior to 1984. I think it was 1986, I can't remember. But essentially, a lot of our fires didn't have it. Random forest is nice because it's a uh, you fill in missing data, but it is limited with <laughs> by missing data. So that, I think that was, that was the biggest surprise for this. Um, yeah, thank you. Cool. All right. We have other questions. I have a question um, just about the soil burn. Since that was kind of surprising to you, did you folks do any um, like lag indices? So like the soil burn index um, or severity of a previous burn in a similar place um, within the watershed, did that, were you able to do any kind of variable that kind of took into account the time lag? Yes, great question. Um, we actually did calculate like a pre-fire lag time and a post-fire lag time, um, as well as like a delta lag time. Um, we used a pretty simplified model, but essentially it boiled down to calculating lag time based on um, slope and channel length and different, um, uh, sorry, uh, hydrologic soil groups of soil. Um, so we did, we did calculate that, and that did have moderate importance for the models.
Thank you. Uh, Christina does have a, a question. What software and workflows do you use for the modeling? So currently it's um, pretty basic, just because my, my background is uh, general civil engineering. Um, so I'm not a data scientist, but I am learning. So um, it's really just um, some simple MATLAB scripts that are all open source. So um, there's one called TreeVagger that I like. Um, it's really good at you know giving you the predictor, predictor importance chart uh, and for like feature for feature engineering. Um, I am taking a machine learning engineering class this semester, so I hope it will be more robust by the time I publish my thesis. But um, currently, yeah, so the, uh, it's tree bagger function on MATLAB, and they also have in MATLAB like a GUI that's pretty user friendly um, that allows you to run um, different things like principal component analysis um, and a few other different um, different studies. Sorry, thanks for the question. <laughs> All right. Yeah, is that, uh, if we have no other questions, we can move on to the next uh, presentation. Thanks a lot, Brent. Hi, everyone. My name is Joey, and I wanted to show you a project that I work on that kind of led me to this water hack week. It isn't my actual thesis research, but it's wanted in a course with two other people, Kelsey and Andrew. And what we did was we tried to look at the nitrate loading in a local river here in on Vancouver Island called the Cowichan River. And we did that using um, the kinematic wave equation, the advection reaction dispersion equation, and data from various sources, including Environment Canada for stream flow and precipitation, GIS for the actual river uh, physical characteristics. And then for the nitrate that was going in, we uh, here in British Columbia, we have land that's zoned for agricultural called the ALR. So we just looked at how much that was around the river and uh, from there parameterize uh, the amount of concentration that's actually going into the river. The kinematic wave equation portion of our model actually worked really well. Um, as you can see in these charts here and here for uh, different years, that's basically just depending on uh, the different levels of stream flow uh, that they had that year to try and see where, where we did on average and on the minimums and maximums. Um, so something we did know, especially in the last one, you can see there's this kind of vertical transformation here between the model and the observations. And what we weren't able to get was data from the local pulp mill, which has an outflow on its current permit. And uh, we hypothesized that if we uh, were able to add that in, that it would probably bring those uh, two lines a lot closer together in those cases. Um, however, the uh, results we had overall were not great. Um, where one of my colleagues actually in the department suggested this might be because of some memory issues, this kind of these uh, straight up and downs. Um, so part of that is why I wanted to come to the Hack Week, learn more about how this kind of stuff works, and uh, maybe we'll uh, come back to this project later, uh, depending on how all of our other research works out. Thanks so much for your time. I'm looking forward to working with you all. All right, cool. Uh, neat to see that this was a class project that might turn into something bigger. Um, we can open it up for questions. Um, I guess to get started, I was wondering, you said you're including um, like agricultural land use. Do you have a time series of that information or is it just static? Um, I don't know how much that might be changing in this particular watershed. Yeah, so um, uh, as you said, this was, a, this was a class project. So the idea here was they wanted to make a kind of selected topics course on uh, wastewater or um, watershed management and kind of bring people together with very little coding experience to build the model. So the, the main effort here was really building the model, uh, especially with the, uh, the hydro, hydrological portions of it. Um, so we didn't get far. We could have dug really far into the agricultural use, which, which we didn't because we could barely get the model working just with uh, normal, um, with the uh, basically constant time series that we had. But uh, with the agricultural land, it is divided into seven different um, categories of agricultural land from very good soil to essentially useless soil. Useless soil being what's normally used for um, other agricultural things like just keeping animals or stuff like that. So um, we, would we would think that if we did go down further down that road, it'd be looking into those categories get it, and kind of parameterizing on average what each different category meant, or like assigning a nitrate load to it and then uh, putting that in. 
Um, further than that, we would, it would just be knocking on the doors of the farmers and asking, um, which is, isn't quite something we had the funding for. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Thank you. What about the data from that pulp mill you mentioned? Is that something that's like freely available or, or are you going to have to go and ask about that? Yeah, so it's not really freely available, which it's surprising because this is um, for provincial standards here in Canada, this is probably one of the most actively managed watersheds we've seen policy wise. So I was kind of surprised that we couldn't just find a time series of the pulp mill data. Um, I'm not sure if we could ask the board or do it like a freedom of information request to get it, but it definitely wasn't publicly available. All we could get was what their maximum was in terms of the permit, which is what made us think looking at that that gap and looking at it, it the gap never exceeded the um never exceeded the allowable outflow that was given to them on their water permit so that made us think that that was probably what it was and um again if we would did continue down this road then we would consider maybe trying to get that data from them all right that's interesting yeah We've got a question from Clarissa. Uh, why did you model nitrate instead of phosphorus? Since nitrate is more of a concern in marine environments and phosphorus is the main concern for river regarding eutrophication. So um, I guess I could look at two sets of that. Nit this nitrate was, the, um, was chosen by the professors who ran the course. And to be honest, uh, most of my background's in CI, so I, di I didn't really consider that question in the first place. Um, having done the research now, um, I would think that uh, one was we just had to choose one and we decided to choose nitrate. But further to that is that the Cowshan River actually outflows into um, Saanich Inlet, which is connected into the Strait of Georgia and then into a marine environment. So I think that part of the reason was the fact that uh, all these nitrates are eventually outflowing into an ocean. Um, I think it's only about 25 kilometers from the top of the river down into the into the salt water. So um, that could have been one of the reasons that they decided, but I, I think it, to a full transparency, I think the primary reason was they just wanted to pick one and they decided to pick nitrates. Well, cool. Thanks, Thanks Joey. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I think our, our next uh, presentation actually is about phosphorus. So good transition here. Excellent. Hi, my name is Parani, and it is very nice to meet you. I am originally from Thailand and currently live in the Seattle area. My work focuses on two aspects. The first is providing analytical support for Thai governmental water management. The other is synthesis of white papers and policy recommendations. Now I am at transitioning to full-time employment, so I am thankful to the Water Hack Week organizer and sponsors for this opportunity to learn new skills, exploring new data sets and networking. I'm interested to learn more about Python, special and time series analysis, uh, among other data science tools and I am working on a project on trend analysis on lake water quality and um, the goal is to find out how the concentrations of total phosphorus in Snohomish County have changed from 2002 to 2016, which is a period that the county has rapid growth. And ideally, I would like to compare the results to studies done by the EPA. I'm thankful to Dr. Mike Brett in Civil and Environmental Engineering at the UW for his guidance. And I hope that something I learned during this week will be applicable to my project. Thank you. Right. Um, yeah, so we can open it up for questions now. You, I guess you mentioned that uh, you're going to compare your results against um, previous EPA studies. So were those 
studies performed during the same time period or was that an earlier time period that, that you're using as a baseline? Um, the study by EPA is the National Lakes Assessment and um, the study is done um, somewhat differently but within the time frame that I'm studying. Basically, uh, they have done a uh, sampling every five years. Uh, one is in 2007, one is in 2012, and I think the next one they have was in 2017, but the result is not available. So yeah, it would be a great learning experience as well about learning the techniques on how I would compare, you know, data that are available annually to the samples that are um, collected differently on a snapshot of like every five years. Cool, very cool. Do we have um, other questions? Uh, Elaine, go ahead. Thank you so much. This was really great. I also looked at your uh, goals slide and it says that you're going to be using decision analytics. Do you want to say a few points of how you put that into your project and determine the um, frequency needed to be able to answer these questions on, on, uh, on phosphorus? Thank you. Um, can you state the questions again, please, Elaine? Yes, no, I'm so sorry. Um, you mentioned on your first slide that you were interested in decision making and you were going to inform policy makers. And you looked at uh, uh, the time series data. And one of the questions that always come up is to how frequent do you need measurements? And you, in your data set, have um, annual and five-year data, do you have any idea how you would tell decision makers, oh, we need uh, annual data or we need more seasonal data? Um, how frequently do you need to take data to be able to be useful to these policy makers? Mm. I think your question is very good. Uh, because that is actually also on my thought, uh, like when you look at data, um, when, when at first, when I have uh, these about 15 years of data, I was trying to divide it into five years, kind of to, you know, um, in a way to replicate what the EBA has done every five years. And I found that, okay, from 2000, to, to 2007 compared to the second period, 2007 to 2012, it seems like things have, uh, like concentrations of several lakes have increased, but then they seems to decrease when you compare to another period. So I think that is a very great question. And um, I, I think I cannot answer at the moment, but I, I have thought about it too, yeah. Yes. But I think your data set will help us answer that. So thank you. Thank you. Hamendra does have a, uh, one more question. Um, what is the main source of total phosphorus in the, uh, in the study lake? Um, in the studies lake, uh, so part of it come with the, uh, the rivers that uh, flow into the lake. And some of it come from, I, I think that some of the lakes, for example, the bigger lakes like Lake Stevens come from the sediment at the bottom. And yeah, uh, that answers the question. Yeah. So, so the one, uh, the, the, from the sediment is then kind of, I think, cumulative from period of before when I study. All right. Um, uh, one more second. Uh, okay, perfect. Yeah, no, no uh, uh, Bethel asks, does Lake Rosinger frequently go anoxic? That might explain the sediment release of phosphorus. 
Yes, yes, you are right. Yeah. So uh, in some of the lakes, which I actually exclude from the study is uh, um, some of the lake have a man, you know, is it called like man-made alteration by adding alum treatment and um, it makes each of the lake actually uh, seems like they are not the same. So I'm trying to pick some that are less uh, human intervene to be able to, to compare them. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. All right, thanks Parani. Um, this is really cool and I love these sort of animations of showing time series change map view. Uh, we can go and head on to our uh, last lightning talk. Hello, my name is Elaine Faustman. I'm professor and director of the Institute for Risk Analysis and Risk Communication at the University of Washington. I look forward during Water Hack Week to work with you and to co-learn with you. Many of my responsibilities at the university means that I teach and learn across schools of engineering, public health, and public affairs. So a great way to go to this week. Hi, and I'm Jill Falman. I work with Elaine. I'm also very excited to be here and learn alongside with you. I'm a research scientist in the School of Public Health. These are some examples of the type of research that we do in environmental public health. And some of the work that we're currently working on is working with Christina Bandaragoda in disaster preparedness and management. And I also have experience doing wastewater surveillance. This slide also shows several other areas where we work. Um, I've worked um, actually globally on issues of water security, which of course would incorporate many of the tools from both public health, but also the tools we'll be sharing and talking about in Water Hack Week. I've also worked on the interface between oceans and human health, focusing on impacts and analysis at nearshore areas. A key factor of the work that we do in the Institute is to use a risk analysis framework to be able to understand how our activities in science are actionable and make a difference using decision analytic tools. Thank you. All right, thanks. We can open it up for questions for our last lightning talk here. I, I have a question. So when you say um, that you're developing these decision-making tools, um, who, who's the intended audience or the intended stakeholders? Are these local or state governments or other community groups or industry? Um, who's sort of the main audience? And hi, that's a great question because the answer is all of the above. So when you develop your analysis, what you want to do is have stakeholders at the table to start to help formulate the questions that they have so that at the end, um, you can be able to answer those particular questions. I think this was especially evident in the early years with the Oceans and Human Health Projects funded out of NSF is that we were producing lots and lots of information, but there wasn't an audience for it. And so I think it's it's critical for us to do our job better, but also to get the local and regional information that stakeholders have to be able to inform this. So it is really a, a dialogue that starts very early on. So that's why I'm excited about these projects to hear um, how people are ensuring that their science gets translated and is translatable. So thank you. Jill, did you have any other comments to add there? No, I didn't have anything to add with you, I guess, to what you said, but maybe that part of our research too is um, focusing on more community uh, participatory based research. So working with communities to try to understand their needs, rather than always just going out and making those decisions independently. Um, so because we're in public health, we try to incorporate more of that. So we know our slides are kind of more broad and more like a specific project focus, but I think because we're kind of Maybe the outliers here who work in public health, we just wanted to give you a taste of what um, some of the work we do. Um, I do have a question. Um, so um, you mentioned disaster preparedness uh, in your slide. So um, I was wondering if you 
um, help communities with their preparedness planning or um, like emergency management planning or any kind of hazard mitigation planning? Yes, right now we're working on a project, a rapid project with Christina and uh, we're looking at this use of geo health information and mm -hmm. how we help that then inform uh, preparedness for the next disaster. So this combination of uh, hydrogeology and health is, as you know, a new disciplinary focus. And so yeah. we're very excited about being at that interface. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that's actually a very upcoming trend in, uh, in disaster plan, uh, mitigation planning. And I was wondering uh, what, uh, because I, I have been trying to delve into it in terms of um, the work that we do at our institute um, in, uh, um, in the urban planning and design um, uh, department. And I was wondering what uh, data sets you use for, for health related data. Well, um, it depends for which location. So that's one of the things that we're working with. And I think Christina may present or at least has data already on the HydraShare um, portal that describes some of the data that they collected after the hurricane in Puerto Rico. So um, stay tuned, maybe this is down in the weeds. So we look okay. forward to talking with you more. And yeah, uh, I'll... Yeah, we'll I'll Yes, this guy is great. Jill, did you have any other comments or maybe Christina wants to jump in? Um, well, I think yeah, part of it, this is a learning process for us too. And part of it, the whole, um, this rapid that we're working with with Christina is to figure out the best ways to share data and to provide better tools to everyone. So it's kind of in line with what we're doing here. Water Hack Week is, you know, learning how to, you know, network and how to actually upload data, share it, and access it. So just expanding our networks and tools. Okay. And we do have a question uh, from Christina, actually. Um, Christina asked, what skills or outcomes are you hoping to add to health research at a data software engineering water hack? So was, it, was the question which skills we're hoping to learn or to add? Uh, like, yeah, I think uh, getting at like, what is uh, maybe a knowledge gap within health research that you could address here uh, with, you know, data science focused uh, and, and water focused uh, hack week? Well, one example that just came up already in the breakout group that I was with, I got to meet, um, I'm just thinking it's Tony uh, Castronova, who mentioned that he's developing a code repository for COVID cases. And uh, it's going to be in the Jupyter notebook format on that. And I got very excited about that because immediately that he, we could try to link some of the wastewater treatment data that's there and uh, environmental uh, measurements of COVID to link that with that. So that was just one example that came up in a few minutes in our breakout session already. But Tony, I hope you don't mind me making a call out to you that that was a great example on that. And uh, so that's just one. Yeah, I would add to that too, I think. Just, I mean, this is probably goes across for every discipline, but just having better document, like better metadata for things. A lot of times, especially in public health, you'll have um, kind of, you receive data and it, you don't really understand more of the context. So it's hard to interpret or hard to apply. So I think using these tools to better, I guess, um, integrate into are into research and then also how to interpret them and how to work with others and just incorporate more um, better data 